The name of this talk is The Silver Tsunami. I don't know, has anybody heard that term? Well, I'm on my way to being silver haired. There is going to be a huge wave of people, older people, silver and white haired people, that we are expecting to have Alzheimer's. And it will drain our families, our finances, the medical system, if we don't do something about it. And until recently, it was thought you couldn't do anything about it. And we're coming to find out that, yes, there are a lot of things that you can do, certainly to prevent it, and even if you're in early stages, to halt the progress, and in some cases, turn it around. So I know you're here because you have an interest in that. You're concerned about your future or the future of somebody you know or maybe somebody in your family has suffered with Alzheimer's. There's hardly a, a person I talk to that hasn't had some connection with somebody with dementia close to them. And watch that agonizing, slow, sad decline. I'm here because I've had my own um, life issues. Um, I've had experiences personally that made me realize that I was gonna burn out and lose my health. And um, I don't want anyone else to suffer the things that I suffered. I had medical care that was standard of care, but it wasn't what I needed. It didn't provide a solution for me. Um, I was diagnosed as having colitis and for probably almost 20 years was treated for it without really relief of my symptoms. And um, put on all kinds of medications, things that kept me up all night, things that I, I, don't, I didn't even want to go into it. But, um, I finally took things into my own hands, and this was about 20 years ago, so people weren't talking about gluten. I thought, let me try going on some kind of elimination diet. So I knew that dairy and gluten were two of the biggest bowel irritants and offenders, and it was like there was no colitis. That was my issue. And I had colonoscopies regularly because I was still labeled as having colitis and increased risk of colon cancer. And when I would get my colonoscopies, once I had stopped the gluten, they were virtually normal. And my GI doctor, uh, I would have thought she would have said, gosh, what are you doing? This is so incredible. You're not on any medicine. And the nurses were shocked. I w when I went in for my colonoscopy, what are you taking? I'm not on anything, really? I'm like, nope, I don't need it. And so I would have thought she would have said, gosh, what are you doing? This is great. You know, maybe I can learn. And all she did was she literally patted me on the shoulder and said, just keep doing what you're doing. It's like, okay. <laughs> you could have really maybe helped some other people. But Anyhow, um, so that's kind of what I went through, and we want to help people so that you don't keep going through experiences like that. So tonight we're going to cover three different uh, main uh, objectives. One is how we in restorative and functional medicine see Alzheimer's differently than the conventional medical establishment. Um, how lifestyle impacts your brain health and what you can do about it and also how hormones are really key to having a healthy brain. So I can't put everything I've learned in all this, you know, last 10 years uh, in, in a short half hour talk, um, but I'll try to impart as much as I can. And later you'll have an opportunity to find out more, to find out how to become a patient. So you will um, have opportunity to um, delve deeper. So one thing that's always on the minds of people as soon as we mention hormones is, oh no, aren't they dangerous? So I want to address that so that's not running through your mind you know, while I'm talking to you and trying to give you new information. Certainly the information on women, which largely came from a big study, it came out actually 15 years ago this July, the Women's Health Initiative in July of 2002. And I won't ever forget the date and the month because it created havoc in the world of gynecologic care. Women went off their hormones wholesale and it's estimated that there were 50,000 unnecessary deaths a year from women going off their hormones and losing the protective effects of their hormones. So the Women's Health Initiative came out with some bad news. Women who were taking Premarin and Provera, which is a synthetic progesterone, had a 30% increase in breast cancer incidence. So they halted the the, drugs, the study early, 
this came out all over the news. It was uh, the NIH in cahoots with um, the media. And so it came out in the media before we ever saw it in a medical journal. So a Sunday night, it was all over the news. And Monday morning, I had people calling me. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> Where do I read about this? So the study didn't come out for a week or two later. And what they did was give women products that were common on the market then, which really should not be used. And there are some places where it is still being used. Um, you should not be on Provera. If you are on Provera, that really needs to get changed because truly it does increase your risk of breast cancer. And if you're on estrogen or another, this is women, if you're on estrogen or another oral form, if you're on estrogen in a pill form, it gets metabolized differently than when you put it on your skin and it increases your risk of blood clots. So the things that you've heard about estrogen and progesterone are true, but you have to look at the details. And once we look at those details and know how to address them, use bioidentical hormones, which are exactly the form of hormones chemically that your own body makes we can give them safely without an increased risk of breast cancer and without an increased risk of blood clots. So I hope that takes care of some of the concerns about estrogen safety. And then for men, the issue comes up about testosterone. It is such old mythology that testosterone causes prostate cancer. And that has been disproven over and over and over again. Somehow a small study of four men from the 1940s who were on testosterone and got prostate cancer has created our understanding for the last 60 some years or 70 years. And when we look scientifically at the literature, it is not true. Testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. And for men, testosterone is tremendously health giving. And we'll talk a little bit more about hormones later. <clears throat> so I, I want you to listen with an open mind and listen to what happened that forced me to see things differently because I didn't always have an open mind. And you see books here by Suzanne Summers. When I first started getting into this area of medicine, I, I said to my friend um, who kind of told me what conferences to go to and how to set up my practice, I was like, do I have to mention Suzanne Summers? And she's like, I don't know how people are gonna understand what you're doing if you don't mention Suzanne Summers. And I, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, she looks like such a dingbat, and she was not Chrissy on Three's a Crowd, and <laughs> like, how can she be, you know, a medical authority? Well, I finally read her book, and it was one woman's story of her menopause journey. That's all, how she got help and who she got it from. And it really opened the public up to the understanding of that you don't have to suffer when you go through menopause. There's help and there are ways to do it safely. So um, no, I did not always have an open mind. And um, it took, I don't fault my fellow physicians when they don't understand what I'm doing. It took me many, many years of practice. I was in an OBGYN practice for 25 years before I saw the light. So it just, it takes doctors a while. What can I say? So the silver tsunami, I told you what it means. It's the coming epidemic of dementia and we need to do something about it. And we gave you a list of things, we'll be going over um, a number of them that you can do right now. You have to get serious about it. You have to take your health into your own hands and you have to spend time and effort doing it. You are not gonna maintain your health if you just keep doing what you're doing and hope it turns out okay. So this is a very active process. You've gotta get yourself involved. So right now there are 30 million people with Alzheimer's <coughs> globally and we are predicted by 2050 to have 160 million people with Alzheimer's. Lots of people are at risk and these are certainly the people that we can impact the most. And we expect to spend over a trillion dollars in care for Alzheimer's disease by 2050 and who knows where the money's gonna come from uh, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. It, it's very prevalent. And women really uh, t a lot take the brunt of it. They are 65% of the patients with Alzheimer's and 60% of the caregivers. 
This is more common than breast cancer. And it's certainly Alzheimer's is more feared than cancer by people because you have a hope with cancer that you can get treatment and maybe have a cure. Previously, we thought there was no cure with Alzheimer's. That was just a death sentence. So people really fear that even more than cancer. There have been studies, there have been president's councils on you know, combating Alzheimer's. There has been a ton of money put into pharmaceutical studies. None of them have worked. One drug had marginal benefit. A few have been approved. They're, keep, they're continuing to pour large amount of money into pharmaceutical studies. Preventing Alzheimer's does not require billions and billions of dollars. It requires things that you do for yourself with your lifestyle every day. So the real facts is previously we thought there were no cures at all. And this was from the Alzheimer's Association website. They've changed it. This was last year. And they said it, this is the only cause of death in the top 10 in America that cannot be prevented, cured, or slowed. One in three seniors is going to have Alzheimer's. So this is the very typical view. And it really impacts what people, what patients, families and doctors do when they start seeing mental decline. If you think it's unstoppable, if you think it's progressive, if you think nothing can be done about it, what are you going to do? You'll go into denial. You'll try to pretend like it's not happening until things get really bad. Family members don't want to think that you're not functioning as well. And so what happens is patients don't seek help. Doctors don't refer. And when somebody finally goes to their doctor, says, I'm having significant memory problems, uh, maybe gets an in-office test, then gets referred to a neurologist, what happens? The neurologist does an exam, does more cognitive testing, and says, great, we'll watch it, come back in six months. And they document this slow, unfolding decline, month, month by month, year by year. And so you end up with a very late diagnosis. And this is really the truth. We don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. You wait till you get sick. I'm telling you, don't wait till you get sick. If your brains are working well now, do these things. You will keep your brain healthy. And our medical system is largely, I mean, you go to the doctor. What do you expect? That you're going to walk away with a prescription. You know, there's not care where somebody I actually had an incident recently where, oh, this is too much information. But anyhow, I had a urinary tract infection. And my doctor said, oh, great. I'll just call some antibiotics in for you. And, you know, and I was having pain. And we'll send you for an ultrasound. And I was like, where's the care? I wanted to go see her. I wanted to have an exam. I wanted to leave a specimen. I wanted to get taken care of. And so I, I was like, you know, telling my husband I had this experience I was very unhappy about. And he's like, get over it. This is medical care now. She didn't do anything out of the ordinary. And it was like, well, I wanted to get taken care of. So really, we have a very different approach here. It's patient-centered. It has to be. Um, we really look at root causes. And with Alzheimer's, this is where it's at. It's not mysterious. There are things that cause it. And your genetics are not your destiny, because everything that you do makes a difference in whether your genetic plays itself out or your genetics don't play itself out. So don't just you know, give up and say, well, my mother had Alzheimer's. I think it's genetic. I don't think there's anything I can do about it. There is so much you can do about it. We're all individual. And what we're learning more and more is we are working a lot with people with toxicities, with mold toxins. How can two people live in the same house that has water damage and mold, and one person is horribly sick with memory problems, fatigue, and decline, and the person living right with them is fine? It's biochemical individuality. And so we're finding out there's a lot of individual genetics that we need to analyze so that we can figure out how you individually get rid of toxins and process things. 
this is where things are at because if you don't process toxins well, you accumulate them. They make you sick. One of the places you get sick is in your brain. We look at lifestyle factors. I know doctors say you should eat better, you should lose weight, they, you know, they have a number of things that they recommend to you, but do they actually sit down with you and say, this is specifically, here's your shopping list, here's some recipes, that's what Jessica, our functional nutritionist does. What do you like to eat? What do you don't like to eat? If you don't like vegetables and we want you to eat vegetables, like how can we make that happen? Uh, you can't just be on your own with somebody saying, make a big lifestyle change. We really take it step by step and personalize it to you so that we take how you function and how you feel about things into account. We look at environmental factors and some of conventional medicine is starting to look at these things. Um, but really in isolated, um, separated groups. I went to a wonderful presentation of the Department of Gerontology at USC, and it was on air quality and dementia. So there are some really well-known researchers there who have very good evidence that living near freeways, what are we going to do? We live near the port, are you going to move? Uh, contributes to dementia. So, um, but most of conventional medicine does not look at environmental factors. Where did you work? Um, we had one patient who grew up in Sacramento and her husband said, oh, you know, we, we both grew up there as kids and they used to take jet fuel and pour it on the ground to get rid of it, to dispose of it, and it seeped into the groundwater. So you're getting all of those um, horrible or organic pollutants in your water and then they get into your body they're hard to get rid of. We have people who are affluent live on golf courses that's great. All the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, rodent killers, all, a lot of that seeps into groundwater or is in the air. We also look at the role of stress because we see a lot of people with brain decline that gets worse with stress or people with brain decline that began at a really horribly stressful time in their lives. They were diagnosed with cancer, somebody in the family got murdered, you know, these really incredible life stresses that we know the physiologic mechanisms. You make a lot of cortisol when you get stressed and cortisol literally shrinks your brain. The less brain volume you have, the worse your brain works. And we really see the patient as a partner, so we, work with people. We don't just lay down, you know, this is what you got to do, take it or leave it. We want you to be effective. We want you to change your health. And so we work with you where you are. And Jessica, our nutritionist, has really gotten compliments from people who previously were just told, just do this. And she started where they were and it keeps them coming back and keeps them changing. This is a visual of what functional medicine is, looking for the root cause of the malfunction. So all of the things that you see on top, hormone imbalances, thyroid issues, depression, Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disease, irritable bowel, chronic fatigue, those are the symptoms. Those aren't the disease and the causes. The causes are down below and there are things like inflammation, stress, poor diet, lack of sleep, trauma, nutrient deficiencies, poor digestion, lack of exercise, toxins, and to even toxic thoughts. So your brain controls your biology. So we are always looking down here because this is what we can correct to change the things that are up above. And we have a new view of Alzheimer's have people heard of beta amyloid, the deposits that happen in the brain of people with Alzheimer's? A lot of the drug uh, investigation for Alzheimer's has been aimed at trying to remove beta amyloid. And what they've found is that even when you remove it, the person still has Alzheimer's. And so when you look at why somebody has beta amyloid, you understand things a lot better. Beta amyloid's actually a protective thing for your brain. If your brain has been invaded by bacteria and is very inflamed, beta amyloid is antibacterial. It's anti-inflammatory. And 
our systems work in a way that we will tend to shut down slowly if we can't sustain ourselves rather than boom, die. And we see that with thyroid. We have a, a thyroid mechanism that will slow our bodies way down if we are without food for a long time. It's a way to keep us from dying quickly. It's a way to keep us sustained until maybe we get our next supply of food. And a similar situation happens in the brain. It's called metabolic downsizing. So rather than your brain just shutting off and that's the end of it, it slowly downsizes so that it can keep going. So it looks like beta amyloid is a protective response to something. And it's that something that we want to find so that you don't continue to deposit beta amyloid. And the new view of Alzheimer's is that it's caused by metabolic and toxic damage. And this is really where our investigation and treatment goes. So this is not just a brain problem. We have people with problems in their intestinal tract that are affecting their brain function with problems elsewhere in their bodies that are then impacting the brain. And so we're very connected. And it's one of the problems with conventional medicine is that you know there's the psychiatrist who deals from here up, and then there's a cardiologist that deals here, and the GI deals there, and the GYN deals here and here. And um, we're interconnected. And s the things that affect our that affect our GI tract for example very much affect our brain and there's something called leaky gut I don't know if people have heard of it it's when you have disruption of that healthy barrier in your intestine if you have leaky gut we're learning that you probably have leaky brain blood brain barrier and the blood brain barrier is a protection around your brain the same things that will give you leaky gut can give you leaky blood brain barrier and allow toxins infections to go into your brain. So maintaining healthy gut health means maintaining healthy brain health. And a lot of maintaining healthy intestinal function is what you eat. The other thing we know is that there is a large window for treatment. And if anything has become clear to me, being in this field of medicine, is that people need to come in early. Don't wait. People wait years and years, and it's just the longer it goes, the more damage there is, the harder it is to do something about it. So if you have some inklings that things are wrong, at least get checked, at least try to figure it out. And we were just talking today, who should we really be concerned about with their brain function? Well, a lot of people have like minor memory problems, some brain fog. Um, those are things that are fairly easy to take care of. But if you are Lose, misplacing things all the time and you didn't before. If you are losing your way or just feel like it's harder to get to familiar places. If you're having not recognizing people's faces, having a lot of difficulty with expressing yourself. These are things that are more serious. But there's, there is a large window. So you want to, at the earlier signs, try to figure things out. And as I mentioned, there's this downsizing. And I just made a picture of littler and little, littler houses. <laughs> you know, it's when you have the great big house, and then you decide you're going to downsize and get, make, get to a smaller house. Uh, you can still live there, but you don't have as much functionality. So Dr. Dale Bredesen, and we're going to be giving away one of his books today. His book came out August 22nd. And it is the whole plan that we implement here at the Sklar Center. And I was personally trained by Dr. Bredis, and I was in his very first training. I bugged the heck out of him to get in there. I kept emailing them and calling them, and they finally got back to me and said, we know you want to come. We'll get in touch with you. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to miss this opportunity. And his view of things is that there are 36 holes in the roof. Well, now there's probably 50 to 100. And if it rains, of course, the roof just leaks and you have a flood inside. If you can patch up some of them, you won't have as bad of a flood. So you don't have to fix every single thing that's wrong leading up to your brain problem. If you can just start working on some of them, things will change. So we found that we have to be incredible detectives. And really, that's what functional medicine is all about, is being a, a detective 
always pursuing what else could it be if we thought it was this and we treated it and it didn't work what else could it be and digging deeper and deeper and deeper so this is our number one thing to recommend to people as soon as they call us and get information about our program and plan to become a patient we tell them this you have to stop eating stuff like this this is poison for your brain just look at that picture and think this is going to poison my thinking ability. Look at it like that until you feel kind of queasy because you are less likely to eat sweets. If every time you think about it, you think, this is going to poison my brain. Uh, resolving inflammation. Some inflammation we are not able to see. Sometimes we have blood tests that show inflammation, but there is inflammation that we can see. People who have rheumatoid arthritis have joint inflammation significant enough that it increases their risk for Alzheimer's disease. People with periodontal disease have systemic, if you have bleeding gums and gum problems, we do a blood test. We take your blood from your arm and it shows inflammation, a high inflammatory marker. How does it get from your teeth into your bloodstream? It is inflaming your whole body, including your brain. So resolving inflammation, getting periodontal disease taken care of, taking very good care of your teeth and mouth. Hormones. So I have some information about hormones that's really impressive. So we learned, we didn't know this until fairly recently, but there are actually estrogen receptors in the brain. That means places where estrogen is meant to land, and testosterone, and actually most of the hormones that are listed here. Hormones all have a role in how your brain works, and they do things like dampen inflammation, help the transmission between one nerve and another, um, help to build up uh, healthy coverings of cells called the myelin sheath. And um, we have evidence of that with estrogen because women who have had a hysterectomy, the earlier you had a hysterectomy with ovary removal, the higher your chances of Alzheimer's. The shorter the time that you've had estrogen in your body, the earlier menopause, the higher your chance of Alzheimer's. So, um, and we also know that with when we do a hysterectomy on a woman before her menopause time, she loses 15% of her brain speed. So estrogen impacts your memory, your brain speed, your brain inflammation. Um, progesterone is also really important. And progesterone is associated with, um, on neuropsych testing, with improved performance. So Progesterone actually improves your brain performance. And vitamin D, which people think of as a vitamin, in fact, it's a hormone. It's in the same family as estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Increases our nerve-to-nerve -nerve transmission by increasing something called acetylcholine. That's a neurotransmitter. It's anti-inflammatory, and it has antioxidant properties. So vitamin D protects your brain against Alzheimer's. And I gave you some guidelines, and we'll go over them a little bit later, because what the lab says is an OK vitamin D, and your doctor, because of that, may think is an OK vitamin D, may not be an OK vitamin D level. So we'll go into that. Um, so hormones end up being a really important part of our programs here in general, but also especially our cognition programs. One of the biggest things we've encountered, and I've encountered it in just about every cognition patient that has come to see me with significant brain decline, are toxins. And Flint, Michigan had a terrible problem with lead. Uh, we just talked to a lady today who had very high levels of lead. Grew up in a house with lead pipes. If your detoxification ability is impaired, you won't clear that out of your system, and you'll carry it around lifelong. She it was a house she grew up in. The other toxins that we've encountered, um, I mentioned water damage and mold. I don't even want to think about what's going to happen in Texas and in the South and in Florida. 
mold creates illness, about 25% of people have the genetics that make it very difficult for them to clear mold toxins. So a lot of people are going to be very sick after this whole sequence of events. So heavy metals, mold, and there are other toxins. They're called biotoxins because they come from biological systems. Mold is a biotoxin. Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses are epidemic. And there's neuro-Lyme where the Lyme um, bacteria actually get into your brain and they impair thinking ability. So we, with our programs, are oh, we're doing a lot of testing to try to figure this out, but searching for what is in there. We can't look into your brain, but we can look at what's circulating in your body that might reflect what's going on in your brain. The other thing we look at is old viral infections. So a patient that we saw today had Epstein-Barr years ago. People have mono. It can get reactivated later in life and it can affect your brain function and it can make, give you fatigue. So these are the kinds of things we're looking for. We also measure mineral levels, your copper and your zinc. Copper is very toxic to the brain, so we want to lower high copper levels. Zinc is essential for detoxifying, so you want to be sure your zinc level is adequate. We look at B vitamins, which are very important for healthy brain function and energy in general. Um, and uh, others. So um, we're trying to lower the ones that are too high, the minerals that are damaging and too high, and bring up the ones that are beneficial and will help you detoxify and function better. So there are some things that I'm going to tell you with lifestyle that you can start doing right now. One of the things that helps your body get rid of cells that are damaged is to starve the cells out. So if you have a 12-hour window between one meal and the next, like supper and breakfast, you will starve out some cells that are functioning poorly. So that's a way to cut down risk of cancer and a way to help your brain function better. And the other thing is not eating right before bedtime. Uh, when you eat right before bedtime, insulin gets released. It suppresses human growth hormone, which is a very healing and um, uh, important hormone. And so it's important to have a window of three hours before you go to sleep. What you eat should look like this. And somebody said, is that a bagel? That's not a bagel. That's an <laughs> apple. It looks like a bagel. <laughs> yes. I, 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 they said, is that a bagel? And I was like, what? Did I make a mistake? No. This is basically vegetables and protein. That's what we encourage people to eat. Low carb, and definitely get rid of the refined carbohydrates. So that's things with sugar, white flour, it's bread, pasta, cookies, pretzels, crackers. I know everybody says, oh my god, what am I going to eat? How am I going to get rid of that? That's what we help you with. And uh, we have a program actually starting in October to help people implement this way of eating. It's going to be a group program run by Jessica, our functional nutritionist. So what happens when you sleep? You might think you're, you're getting by great on a few hours sleep. I was just telling Dr. Nicole to the, today, when I was an intern, we were on for 36 hours and off for 12. Well, during that 36 hours, uh, we would divide the night up between 11 at night and 7 the next morning. And if it wasn't too busy, you might be able to get four hours sleep. You either got the 11 to 3 a.m. or the 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. And I said, if I got four hours sleep, I was great the next day. I felt like nothing had happened. Well, it's not good for your brain because what happens when you're sleeping? We're just learning this. This is brand new information, cutting edge. There's something called the glymphatic system. So I know you've heard of the lymphatic system, and I'm not saying it wrong. There's something called the glymphatic system, and it's in your brain. There is fluid circulating around your brain all the time. We know that, cerebrospinal fluid. When you go to sleep, your brain kind of shrinks down temporarily while you're sleeping, and this fluid has the opportunity to circulate much more vigorously and remove all of the waste products, all the garbage that accumulated during the day while you were awake, and remove it. So if you short yourself on sleep, or you have sleep apnea and you, you're not using your CPAP, or for whatever other reasons you are not getting good sleep, 
you are not clearing the garbage out of your brain that gets accumulated during the day. So if you're having problems sleeping, that's one issue. You need help trying to figure out why. But if you're just staying up late and thinking you're getting a bunch of stuff done and burning the candle at both ends, I'm telling you, nothing is important as your need to get sleep for your health and your brain function. And the other thing about sleep, if you short yourself on sleep, you have problems with blood sugar regulation, you have problems with your weight, you, you know, a lot of things go awry. So, uh, but we're focusing on the brain tonight. So sleep is really important. Stress reduction. I mentioned before that high cortisol levels, cortisol is a hormone that is released when we get stressed. High cortisol levels directly shrink your brain. They directly, so cortisol directly shrinks the hippocampus, which is where you lay down new memories. It's a particular part of your brain. And when things shrink, they don't work as well. So stress reduction is absolutely essential to a good functioning brain. And the same thing goes is for sleep. If you think you don't have time to eat right, sleep enough, and meditate or do Tai Chi or prayer, whatever it is that brings those cortisol levels down for you, you are gonna put yourself at, at additional health risk. And there's very, very strong uh, scientific studies on the effect of stress in women and breast cancer. Stress plays a big role in development of breast cancer. So not only cognition, but other health risks uh, are caused by lack of, uh, by too much stress. And then there are things to keep your brain active and functioning. Reading is probably one of the best. So read, read, read. Crossword puzzles, there was a study that showed if you did crossword puzzles four days a week, you have to do it a lot. That cut down your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 35%. But the thing that was most impressive in that article, and it's more having to do with exercise, that if you dance, you cut down your risk of Alzheimer's by 75%. <laughs> oh, wow, so yeah, get out there and dance. Um, and it can't just be, it can't be dance, it can, you, you need to constantly challenge your mind. So it can't be the same old things that you've always done. You need to go to a class where either they make you improvise or you're following a leader and you're not sure what they're gonna do, so you have to like kind of keep your brain going. So really innovating is key, learning something new. And Brain HQ is something that Dr. Bredesen recommends that's an, a computer game. And there are things that fly around the screen and you click on them, you try to do it faster, you try to be more dis discerning in what you're doing. So for people who like doing things on the computer, Brain HQ is, he promotes it because it's the only online brain training that has actually been shown to prevent Alzheimer's disease. There's Lumosity and some of the other ones, but they don't have the scientific information that Brain HQ has. And it was developed by a guy named Stan Merzenich, who is considered the father of the modern theory of neuroplasticity. And what is neuroplasticity? What is something when it's plastic? It's flexible, right? Neuroplasticity refer, refers to the flexibility of your brain, that you can learn new things, that you can lay down new nerve pathways, <coughs> even when you have damaged ones. So part of what we do, we lay the fertile ground by cor correcting the metabolic problems that are going on in a person's body. But then you need to work to lay down new pathways so that you can have an alternative to the damaged ones. The earlier you treat, the greater the chance that you can turn things around. Mainly, we've been able to help people with uh, early Alzheimer's um, and what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is the step before early Alzheimer's, at least stabilize and not get worse for the most part. Um, we've had a couple of people that have had some reversal. Um, it really requires working like it's your full-time job. So, I won't say it's an easy program, but it can be very effective. And the fact that we have stabilized most of our patients really is a message that the sooner you get in, the less you're gonna lose. So our process is that 
uh, you call and we talk to you on the phone and I'll be telling you more about that uh, as a free consult. And then we give you, we find out what's going on with you and tell you whether we can help you or not, whether we have a solution for you. And if it looks like promising, we ask you to gather information if you're somebody that's having memory and cognition problems so that we can figure out if you're somebody that this is likely to work on. And if we determine that it is, we set up an exam called a comprehensive exam. And we just did one with a patient today. She was here for three and a half hours. We went over her health history, which we spent an hour and a half, like where do you go to a doctor? And they spent an hour and a half delving into your health history. We spent 45 minutes going over her lab results. And then she's gonna come back tomorrow and spend an hour with our functional nutritionist health coach going over what we're starting to implement with her diet and her hormones and her supplements. And that's the personalized treatment plan. So people are on a plan. We usually ask for one year, give us a year. Um, the lady we saw today I think is going to need two years because she has so many toxins. It's going to take a really long time to get rid of them. But that's the personalized treatment program where you work with us on an ongoing basis at regular appointments every month. We also treat other types of problems, anti-aging, slowing down the aging process, helping people with fatigue, intestinal problems, anxiety, and depression. So there are a lot of realms that we're involved in besides cognition. These are the things that are going to get you on the road toward keeping your brain healthy. Thank you so much. You've been a great group.